sequences in BioPython. And I'm going to sort of expand a little bit more on a concept of object-oriented programming. Maybe it will help things become a little more uh, intuitive or make a little more sense. And quite frankly, it will make, uh, it'll make uh, this whole object-oriented thing sort of... It will explain it a little better, okay? So uh, I've repeated this already a few times, but if we, you know, we can look at the world and sort of break it down into uh, different categories of things, right? Um, and, you know, we can come up with the most general category that will describe everything. For example, objects, right? Everything can be an object. And then we can break it down right into, say, you know, there could be non-living objects and living objects, but, you know, they both sort of participate in this category of objects, right? So they're sort of specializations of a more general thing, right? You can go all the way down, for example, to triangle, which is a special type of shape, uh, a special type of closed shape, which is then a special type of shape, special type of non-living object, special type of object, okay? So this whole, like, specialization uh, idea is, is sort of what, what drives this whole object-oriented uh, concept in, uh, in Python and many other languages. If you look at it in Python, it looks something like this, like I showed you. The most general thing we can come up with is a class called ob object, right? It's really a very generic way to define an object. Um, and then we can have things that sort of specialize it, so still participate in it, but they have their own particularities, right? So integers are a type of object, but they're not the same thing as lists, and they're not the same thing as strings. When you define your own class, what you're doing is you're saying, well, I'm going to take object and make it a little more special, and I'm going to name it Natalie in this case, okay? So every time you make a class, other, unless you specify otherwise, you're kind of um, branching off this object category and making it a little more specific, okay? So this, this whole idea of, of taking a sort of a parent class or a more general class and uh, making it a little, you know, customizing it is called um, inheritance, okay? Um, what happens is that um, you inherit any attributes that belong to the object class or whatever class you're inheriting from into your current class, Natalie. Just like, for example, non-living objects inherit all the properties of objects and then have their own properties, or, you know, a tree has all the properties that a plant has, right? And then its own properties, like it has a bark or something, right? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, just a little terminology here. A class that um, sort of is a child of another class is called a derived class or a child class or whatever, but it, officially it's called a derived class. And um, the parent or the ancestor is called the base class, okay? That's just sort of think of this tree, right? The sort of the ancestor is the base class, the derived thing is the, the subclass or, um, yeah, subclass. Okay. So let's just look at some examples here. I mean, I showed you this, right? If you wanted to define your own class, this is the most simple thing you can do. You say class, you give it a name, and then you say pass, meaning I'm not going to do anything, right? You know, so stuff, stuff happened here, and what actually happened was that you inherited a bunch of attributes and a bunch of definitions from uh, the class object, okay? So whatever is defined inside of object, you get to use it too, right? By default. So any class, any custom class that looks like this is going to have all the attributes that the t object class has, right? When you, you know, you inherit sort of uh, your attributes from your parents. If you want to check that this is the case, um, let's just run this cell. There's a function that lets you check whether something is a subclass of another class. So it's just called is subclass, and you say, all right, I define this class. I want to know if it's a subclass of the object class, okay? I hit enter, and it tells me true, all right? If I went the other way around, I would get false, okay? So my class is a subclass of object, but object is not a subclass of my class, right? If you looked at this picture, right, this is the subclass, this is the base class, right? Let me just bring that back, okay. So in this object class, there's these some functions that let us create objects, right? And I showed you what they were. They're the new class and the init class, okay? New creates the object, the little machine spits it out, and then init sort of lets you customize it and add attributes to it and whatever. So when we create an object, very simple, we just have to say the name of the class and then call it like a function, and then we get an instance of that class. So a particular, um, you know, occurrence of that type of object, okay, M. It's its own object. Um, 
if we wanted to check if something is an instance of a class, we have a similar method, a function called isInstance. So we can give it our object and a class, and it'll tell us whether or not that is an instance of that class. So m is an instance of my class, right? Just like how we had the, R and the RNA class, and we can have individual RNAs with different sequences, they're all instances of that class. It's also an instance of the class object, right? So it kind of goes down this tree. Okay. So I'm going to add a little bit of syntax here. Um, so by default, when you don't, when you do things like this, like I told you, you're inheriting from the class object, okay? Which is equivalent to saying, when defining your class like this, giving it the name, and then in brackets, as sort of an argument, you give it the name of a class object, okay? This tells Python, when you define this class, you're going to inherit all the attributes from this class. So this is sort of the parent, and this is the child, okay? I wrote it up here. Imagine you have a class, you call it parent. You want to inherit from it, so get all of its attributes. Um, then you can just give its name as an argument in the class definition, okay? All right. So now I'm just going to do a little example to illustrate this um, with animals, all right? So I'm going to define a really general class that describes animals, all right? Animals all have a certain number of legs, okay? This is something I can say about any animal. Uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to have a class animal, and just for formality, I'm going to say that it inherits from the class object. I could equivalently remove this, and it would behave the same. Python assumes that you're going to inherit from object. And uh, I don't want to have it just be a generic object. I'm going to give it an attribute, right? Whenever this object gets created, it's going to take on this attribute uh, called number of legs. And I'm going to set it to n, which is whatever the person that creates this object is going to type in when they call the, the class uh, the class name, okay? So let's compile that. Now I can create an instance of animal, okay? So I can say I want an animal with four legs. All I have to do is say, call the name of the of the class and give it the argument for, which is going to go into this, this n here, and it's going to be the value of this attribute num legs, okay? You can print the object and it looks like this, okay? Python uh, doesn't really know how to print animals, right? It knows how to print strings and lists, but it doesn't know how to print animals because we just made it up. So it just gives you this... Uh, sort of vague string that tells you it's a type animal, and this is sort of its uh, address, okay? So um, a cool thing is the print function, right? Whenever you say print something, what it does is it actually looks for a specific method of that object, okay? Um, that method is called underscore underscore str for string, and every object has to have one of these methods um, whenever print gets called, okay? so when I say print uh, a, print this animal, Python says, is there, does this object have a string method attached to it? What that string method does is it just returns some string that's supposed to be what gets printed out, okay? And because we inherited from object, um, right, we inherited from object, object has its own definition of string, okay? And what it does is it prints out something like this, okay? It gives us this message. So this is Python calling right through print. It's looking for this underscore underscore uh, str method. It sees that it's not defined anywhere in our class, so it looks at the parent object. If I showed you the code, you would see that there's a function definition underscore underscore str um, that returns a string, and that's how Python knows how to print an object. Okay. Now let's say we want to customize this. What we would do is okay, we're going to make our our class animal. Uh, take everything from object, but actually define its own version of this string method, okay? So all I have to do is define it inside my class definition. So underscore underscore string, it takes as argument the object, right? Self is always an instance of the class that you're in, so this is an animal instance. And then I just return a string, it can be whatever I want. Um, I'm just going to make a nice message here that says, this animal has self dot number of legs, okay? Oh, and actually I added an attribute here. E for the food that the animal eats. Okay, so this this and it takes two arguments: uh, the animal number of legs and the number of uh, the type of food it eats. Okay, so now if I construct an object from this class, I do it like this: I give it two arguments, the number of legs and what food it likes to eat. Okay, so now if I print it, I get this message instead: this animal has four legs and it's a meat eater. All right. So what happened was Python said, okay. Uh, I'm printing an animal object here. Let's look inside the animal class. Oh, okay, this underscore underscore string special method 
was defined, so I'm going to use this instead of the parents. All right? So the child overrides the parents. This is called overriding. Okay? So you can inherit from, some, from a class, but then you can also kind of reset some, some things you inherited to your own things. All right? So if you remove this, right, we would still be able to print, but we would be using the object class's string method instead of our own. Is that clear? OK. So that's an example of um, overriding. All right. Now, um, this is sort of as far as we went uh, when we talked about objects before. But it turns out we can go as far as we want sort of inheriting from classes. OK. So let's say I have this class animal. It's really great. It lets me count the number of legs on an animal and know what food it eats. Um, but obviously, we can be a little more specific than that. And we can say, well, there's another type of animal, and it's a dog. OK? So dogs are also animals. So they're going to have some characteristics that are inherited from animals. Um, but they're going to have also their own kind of things that, that's specific to them. So what we can do is we say a class, class dog, and it's going to inherit from animal. OK? So what happens there is anything that is defined in animal is now defined inside dog unless you define anything new or you override anything that was defined in the animal class. Right? So here I'm going to define my own init method. Uh, I'm going to take his argument an object of type dog. And I'm going to take uh, this b, which I'm going to set to be uh, this attribute of the class breed. Okay? So dogs can have breeds. All right? um, so I'm just going to set that to the input. And then you know, dogs also have a number of legs, and they also eat some specific type of food. right? And I want to use that when I create an object. I don't have to redefine these attributes. I don't have to say self dot number of legs and self dot food, right? Because I already did that from the parent class. So all I have to do then is say, all right, I'm going to use the parent class animal, and I'm going to use its init method, call it, on this dog object, and give it that I have four legs and I eat meat. Okay. So this just calls the parents in it, and it uses it to set these attributes. Yes? Yes. Here I'm, I'm really just accessing a method from a class. OK? But That's all. That. Oh, if I take this out, it would still work. Oh, okay. This would still work. It's just that my object wouldn't have these attributes set. The dog wouldn't have the attributes number of legs and um, type of food set. Right? This? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what this is doing is when I construct a dog object, I'm going to call the animals method for initializing and set, its, set these attributes for it. It's just telling it how to initialize. Yeah, if you don't do it, you're not going to have these attributes, basically. You would have to do them yourself. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Right now, no, actually. That's a good point. Right now, you would still be able to access, you'd still be able to do this. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'll show you where that comes in. Right? But right now, you're, you're explicitly going to a class and calling one of its methods. This, uh, this you'll see uh, in, in two seconds. Okay, Good point. Um, all right. So now I can sort of define a dog okay, a little more specifically. I can say uh, I'm going to create an object dog, PYR, and all I have to specify now is its breed. It's going to be uh, Great Pyrenees, because that's my dog the breed. And um, I don't have to say how many legs or what type of food it eats, because I know I'm creating uh, a dog. So this part takes care of that, right? It says I'm, it's going to have four legs, it's going to eat meat, because all dogs do that. So I'm just going to set that right from the beginning. And all I need to know is the breed of the dog. All right? So I've stored this dog object. I can print it. And what happens then, OK, I'm printing, the, I'm printing using the animal string uh, function. OK? So because I told Python that I'm inheriting from animal, it knows to look there for the string method. If I didn't do that, then it would say, well, you're inheriting from object. Whoops. And it uses the, the object class's string. Okay? 
So this tells it this tells Python where to look for uh, methods. So animal. Okay. We'll do that again. Now we're using our parents uh, string. All right. And we also have this extra attribute breed. All right. So now we can keep track of the breed. Um, obviously, this breed attribute is specific to dogs only. Not every animal has a breed, sort of. So we're sort of specializing this general class. All right. So inside of uh, child classes, you can also define your own methods, all right? Um, and these methods are going to be specific to objects of the type dog, for example, all right? So not, on, not all animals bark, but dogs do bark. So we're going to put in a new method here, bark. That's going to take a dog object as input. And it's going to say, if this dog's breed is Great Pyrenees, you're going to bark 10 times because they bark like a crazy amount. Um, otherwise, you just bark a normal amount, OK? So uh, it's going to create this dog. All right, we call the bark method on this dog who happens to be a Great Pyrenees. And it's going to bark a bunch of times and really loud. Um, if I make another dog, it's going to you know, it's going to know the difference now. Okay? So this is a method that acts on dog object because it's defined inside the dog class. Okay? But if I were, for example, to create an animal object um, and try to make it bark, it's not going to bark because animals don't bark, right? It's really just this special object that inherited from the animal class that can do that. All right? And we can keep sort of uh, customizing things and passing them down from our parents in a nice way. So for example, um, we saw this uh, print message right from, from uh, the parent class, which uh, says like, this animal has four legs and is a meat eater. So that's kind of how we define that we want this object to be printed. And because we're printing a dog, the dog doesn't have its own string method. So it looks at the parent, and we look at the parent, and it has, oh, it has a string method, so we use that one, OK? But let's say we want to sort of customize our, our string method a little more inside of our dog class. Well, we could do that too. So we've got our initialization. We've got our bark method that we've done. So we can take our string again and, and define it. And we can use, uh, we can sort of combine it with the animal string method and our own. So we can say animal dot underscore underscore string. So that's going to return this string that tells us how many legs and um, uh, what type of food it eats. And we can add to it uh, some information about this special child object, right? Which in this case will be this dog breed. Okay. So I'm going to initialize my dog here again, and I'm going to print it. So now I have this animal has four legs and is a meat eater because we're accessing the animal class's string method. And um, it's also um, a Pyrenees dog, OK? All right, and we can also have several uh, classes that inherit from the same one, obviously. So let's say if we wanted a cat, well, we can also have cat inherit from animal. And you know it'll use the animal's initialization method. And it'll also, uh, I don't know, have its own thing like color. I don't know cat breeds, but I know them by color. So these ones get color. OK, so now we have something that looks sort of like this. You know, We have object, which is the most general class. And when we create animal, we inherit uh, attributes from object, like the initialization, the string, all these things. That lets us create animal objects. And if we want to sort of subtype these things, we can make a dog that inherits from animal, and we can make a cat that inherits from animal. Okay. Let me just take it one more step further. Uh, let's say we want a specific dog in particular. Okay. So you know, the dog describe dogs in general, like in terms of a breed, but you know. I have my own dog, and he has a name. So we're going to have a class uh, for that, so a class of specific dog. Okay. So this is now a specialization of the dog class, right? which is a specialization of the animal class. So we can just say, all right, I'm going to initialize here with a name and a breed, because when I create a dog, I need to know its name and its breed. Um, so I, I say, OK, I'm going to accept that in my initialization method. And um, I'm going to use dogs uh, in it because that takes care of the number of legs and what food it eats. But I still need to tell it what breed. So I call the initializ initialization method from dog, which is my parent. And additionally, I add this new attribute name, which is the dog's name. Okay. So let's run that. And now I can say, well, I have a specific dog now with a name and a breed. Okay. So now I have this, this attribute particular to my dog, and I can bark. Okay, it barks accordingly because of the breed. 
and that was defined in the dog class, okay? So now finally we have like something that looks like this. Object, animal inherits from object, dog and cat inherit from animal, and specific dog inherits from dog, okay? So I want to say about that. Um, I have a little summary of the key points. Um, and I guess the, the, the main reason that this exists is just to save you from writing a lot of repetitive code, okay? Um, so I wrote down all these classes that, that I defined as though we weren't inheriting at all. So as if, if there's no this, none of this like chain uh, structure, right? I can just define a bunch of classes that directly inherit from object. I can still do that, and it would look something like this. So I would have my animal class, right, where I define the number of legs and food, right? That's fine. But now I want to define the dog. Well, I have to say, all right, I need to, again, repeat that I want to have a number of legs, and I want to have a specific type of food and breed. So you're seeing, like, this repetitive code happening, right? That's no good. Um, so it's really just a lot more repetitive and less sort of clean to understand, okay? So lots of repetitive code. Here we have less repetitive code. I just put everything into one block so you can see what it looks like. Um, so yeah, so now you can sort of customize uh, classes and add any kind of functionality you want to them. Like for example, we can do that to the BioPython uh, sequence class, okay? So I'm importing seek from uh, BioPython. And let's say I want to define my own type of sequence object, okay? Well, I don't have to redo everything they did. I just have to say, okay, I'm gonna inherit from that. I'm gonna take everything you've done and I'm gonna sort of call your initialization method, seek.init, and I give it the specific sequence, which is something you always need when you create a, a BioPython sequence, and I'm gonna give it my own attribute. Whatever I want, I'm just gonna say that it's equal to hello, okay? And let's say um, I wanted to add so, a useful function. For example, I, I want sequences to also give me the GC content of the sequence, which is just the number of Gs and Cs in the sequence divided by the length, okay? It's just a percentage. Um, now I can add that sort of functionality to sequences, okay? So I can start off an object, s equals my seek. I give it a sequence. And now I have all the functionality that, that BioPython defined for me. For example, I can transcribe it, right? But now I also have my own attribute that I added to it, hello. And I also have this new method that it can do that uh, I defined, okay? Is that, is that fine? Okay? Very nice. All right. So, I'm going to go back to uh, the BioPython uh, lecture and just finish it off. Um, so, yeah. This stuff is, is cool and useful, um, but I would say just... Um, I would just not, too wor not worry too much about the specifics. Like it's really just teaching you how to look up documentation and know that there's a bunch of these functionalities you can use. Um, obviously, we're not going to ask you to memorize every sub function and module that there is in BioPython. Um, obviously, you know main ones are good to know offhand, and um, it's really just to practice, you know, Python. And um, so yeah, and it's a lot of information, but it's really just a demonstration more than anything. Um, if there's anything specific that we want you to use, we'll tell you, like, this is how this works, use it, okay? Again, also, we're not testing you on the biology here either. It's not a biology class. It's just, an, it's just sort of the background. So don't worry too much about the, about the other stuff. Just really focus on the Python. So, okay, I'm, I, I think we left off on uh, sequence record objects. Uh, we downloaded this, uh, the DNA sequence from the bubonic plague and as a faster file, and we saw that we could... Uh, sort of get extract the information. Yes. Yes. So you go on your terminal uh, or your command line, and you just say conda install biopython. Okay. Enter. Um, kind of like you how you install like for assignment two, you have to install a, a package. Yeah. Same thing. Um, yeah. So we saw that we could sort of extract information from these uh, faster files, which Chris talked about. Um, he showed you how to do it uh, the, uh, manually. This has been uh, implemented for us in BioPython. All we have to do is specify a file name and a format to this seekio.parse function, and it just gives us everything in a nice uh, structure. So um, it basically takes every line in the file and turns it into this object type called sequence record, seek record, okay? Which has a bunch of attributes, like um, 
you know, uh, descriptions, some features, some formats, some annotations that are associated. So for example, this bubonic plague file told us, you know, the species that we're working with, um, some identifiers, and the method that was used to extract that sequence. That all gets stored for us conveniently into something called a sequence record object, okay? So um, this seekio.read method, um, it just lets you read a, sing a file that has a single entry in it. The seekio.parse gives you uh, something you can loop over if you have multiple records in your FASTA file. Um, but here I have one with a single record, and I can print it. So you see that this is a kind of like a useful looking print message, right? You have ID, name, description. This is because uh, BioPython defined their own underscore underscore string method and made it look like this. Otherwise, it would have had these weird addresses in there that we saw before, okay? So right away, all this information got stored for us uh, directly, right? It's ID, it's the name, description, uh, the, the sequence itself, which is a sequence object, um, and the alphabet type. So we have all these all these features, right? That we can access right away without having to do any loops over the file or anything. Okay. We can also create our own sequence record objects. So let's say we've done some processing and we've figured out some information about a specific sequence. We can store it inside a sequence record object, which we do just normally. Like you give the class name and you specify whatever you need to give in the initialization method. For example, a sequence object and then some ID, the name, some description of that sequence, right? And it all gets stored inside of this record, okay? So it's just an object with a bunch of attributes. You're just creating an object here, all right? And BioPython lets us right away print that off into a, into a file, all right? We convert it to FASTA format. So this takes our, our sequence record and turn, puts it into FASTA format for us. So it generates the header and it writes down the sequence and we can right away take that and put it in a file. And that we would do just normally using file opening. So we open some file for writing, and then we just say file.write and our record in fast format. Okay? And that produces um, just a normal file here, um, my FASTA, right? With our record. It's super zoomed out. Okay? So yeah, that was just a little bit of the sequence record uh, module and how to write and input files. It's, it's huge, like I could never cover all of it. So, you know, just have an idea of what it can do and then look it up on your own if you're interested, okay? So uh, I'm gonna end off on a little demonstration of something cool that you can do with, with these uh, sequence objects, um, which is uh, make alignments and uh, phylogenetic trees, okay? Um, so, I think in assignment one, we got a bit of a, a bit of a taste of what alignments are, right? You just take a, a sequence, a bunch of letters, and you have another one, and you want to match them up so that, you know, you're reducing the number of differences between the, the columns in your, in your sequences, okay? We don't have to worry too much about how that works. We're just going to use that functionality from BioPython. Um, we need some sequences to start off, so I decided to just generate some. Um, the way I did that is I said, okay, I'm going to generate sequences from this alphabet, right, ACGT bases, and I'm going to store these sequences in a list, right? And then I'm just going to say, all right, um, I'm going to have a, a seed sequence that's just going to be generated randomly with this uh, long list comprehension. I won't go into it, but basically it's just creating a random sequence. And then um, I'm appending... Uh, sequence record objects to this list by creating a sequence randomly and I'm mutating it just so that they're not all the same sequence, right? That's all done here. Um, this just generates uh, a, a random string with some mutations in it, okay? Kind of like what you have to do for the assignment. Um, and then I'm just creating a sequence record object with this sequence and some ID that I give it, okay? Just some number that gets attached to the sequence record, okay? And then I'm just appending it to my list of sequence records. So now I have a bunch of sequence records here, right, um, that I can now use, okay? So we want to, at the end of the day, build this uh, phylogenetic tree that's going to tell us, you know, how these sequences are related in evolutionary time or whatever. Um, and in order to do that, we need to have an alignment of these sequences, okay? 
And BioPython lets you handle all these uh, different formats and algorithms for aligning sequences. Um, I'm not going to go into them too much, but basically you usually need a FASTA file with the sequences that you want to align. So since we have a bunch of sequence records, we can just write them out to a file. All right, basically in one line, we use the sequence IO method write, and we give it our list of sequence records. Um, we give it the file we want to use and the format, and boom, it writes it to a, to a file, okay? It should be in this file now called seeks.fasta. Right, so we have a bunch of, a bunch of uh, sequences in FASTA format that I just generated randomly and dumped into this file. Now I can use that to uh, build an alignment, okay? You can do alignments in BioPython, um, but you have to install and download a bunch of uh, software. So I decided, you know, let's just go with the online tool, um, which they usually accept um, a FASTA file, right? So you just go on this, one of these uh, popular ones is called Muscle. All you have to do is uh, upload a file here with your, your sequences, okay? Your FASTA file that you generated from Python. And you just say, okay, submit. And this is going to do all the matching, right, and then make an actual uh, sequence line for you. And, you know, it's going to run, whatever. It's going to give us back something. And uh, because I did this already, I have the results. It's, it's just a text file in some specific format that BioPython knows how to read, so we don't have to worry about opening it. Um, and basically, there's a module in BioPython that deals with alignments, okay? So there's a bunch of different formats, a bunch of different algorithms for alignments. BioPython lets you sort of write them and parse them and do all sorts of stuff with them. Uh, I'm not going into too much detail. All we want to do is read the output from this, uh, this alignment server, right? Okay, so here's our alignment, right? So we can take that and build some sort of phy phylogeny from it. Okay, so now we have, uh, we have this alignment stored from the read method, which reads our alignment file that we just received. Um, and now we can use that to build a, a tree, okay? And basically, um, how these phylogenetic trees work um, is kind of nice. All you need is to know how different every sequence is, okay? So you have 10 sequences. You look at every pair of sequences and you say, well, this one is five nucleotides away from that one, and this one's three, and this one's four. You have a pair, all these pairs of sequences, and from that you can build, or you can infer what the evolution of that group of sequences was, okay? So in order to get there, you need this uh, thing called a, dis a distance matrix, which is really just um, taken care for you by pi taken care of for you by pi BioPython. Um, you, you use this distance calculator method. Um, you give it an alignment that we computed earlier. And from that, it says this sequence is five points different from this one, right? So you have something that looks like a matrix, right? Uh, you know, these are all pairs of sequences, and the numbers in, in the matrix would be uh, differences between them, okay? So I'll worry too much about them. But yeah, so this is really just a number of comparing how, how similar two sequences are, okay? And from that, we have this cool method called uh, tree construct, uh, distance tree constructor, okay? Again, we just import it from BioPython, and it needs this matrix to build its tree. So what, what we need to do is initialize an object of type distance tree constructor, which takes a specific um, calculator, which we defined up here. Let me see. Yeah, so th this is just a, a method that knows how to calculate the difference between two sequences, okay? Anyway, the point is, from that, BioPython has these algorithms implemented that can build this uh, phylogenetic tree from us, okay? for us. And that got stored in, inside this thing, upgma tree, okay? So we say constructor.buildtree, we give it our alignment, right? And it has already this calculator uh, object attached to it, um, and we should have built a tree. And we can use this, um, we can use this visualization tool called Philo, from, again from BioPython, um, to draw the tree, okay? If that worked, yeah, okay, it worked. So now we can have this, uh, these pictures biologists love to look at um, that basically uh, each, you know, each leaf in this, in this tree is one of the sequences that, that we had. And um, the, the sort of branching right, reflects how they would have diverged in evolution, okay? just based on comparing sequences through BioPython.
Right? It probably has to do with how similar the, the sequences are from their ancestor or something like that. Yeah. For example, if it's a really long branch, that might mean that might mean that a lot of time elapsed between when they diverged from their ancestor and, and now. Yeah, probably. Yeah, basically. I'm not an expert in this, but um, I think that's how it works. So yeah, I mean, this was just one specific example. Uh, obviously, we don't expect you to like memorize how to do this or anything. Um, just a little demonstration. Uh, I think that's all tomorrow. Uh, no, Monday, we're going to go into looking at molecular structures, something I know a little more about. And uh, yeah, that's all. Have a nice weekend, guys. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Yes. Um, uh, yes. First question is, can some classes inherit from one, more than one database? Yes. They can. They can. Uh, the second thing is, okay, the first example, uh, let's say I create an object class called Q. Yeah. And I insert data from the Q class into the database. Yeah. And then I have a name string, let's say a list of 10 students, and their GPA data. How do I iterate over them? Or is there a way to iterate? Yes. How would I go about this? Using classes? Okay. Using classes? Yeah. Or is there a I mean, so usually classes are, are used to organize data, like sort of attach these fields to data. I mean, you could create an object that represents a student, right? Let, let, let's do something like that, actually. OK, so I can say something like uh, class student, right? And um, Self, name, and GPA, OK? Equals name, self.gpa equals GPA. OK, so this is just going to define an object that describes students, OK? And like as, as far as I would do it, that's all you would need if you wanted to, OK? Then you would just say, you know, you would open your file with your data, right? You know, students, right? And then you could say, you know, Imagine like my line, like for line in lines, for line in S, for, so for every line in this file, I know that, um, you know, uh, my new student, I'm going to create a student object, and I know that line at zero is the name, uh, line at zero is the, is the name, and line at one is the GPA, right? I mean, this, it's really just reading data from a file and storing it in an object that you created. I mean, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Okay, but let's yeah. say that now I've created 10 objects, which is just the 10 students. Yeah. And I want to figure out how many of these students have yeah. a GPA of over 3. Yeah. And let's make this 5 of them. So how would I, like, is there a way of iterating over these objects? Okay, so then, so no. So once you have the object, it's, it's there, right? It, you'd have to store it in a list or something if you wanted to iterate. Okay. So you could do something like define a new class, uh, you know, uh, course, right? And that would have uh, as an attribute um, some a list of students, right? Uh, like that, okay? And then let's say now I have, uh, I have my students here in an empty list. Every time I get a student, I append it to this list. Okay, so I'm just appending student objects to this list. And then when I'm done, I can say I can create a, a course with this uh, student list. OK? So now this object C is going to have an attribute dot students. That's going to be a list of student objects. And then from there, I could iterate. I can say for student in C dot students, right? Um, oops. Uh, you know, if GPA is greater than 2, print um, student dot name or something. So you need to create another no, you don't need to actually. This is just actually, I'm just trying to use objects to a point that is ridiculous. Like, you could really just have this list of students, and then you can just go over for s and students. Uh, if s dot grade is greater than two, print s dot name, something like that. Yeah? You, uh, yeah, it's fine. And also, don't worry, guys, about inheriting multiple uh, from multiple classes. I didn't want to mention that. Um, let's just stick to one for now. But yeah. It's a good question.